Good morning, brothers and sisters. As we return to our study in the book of Judges, should we humbly seek our Heavenly Father's wisdom, his guidance, and his blessing as we open this chapter and look to understand the symbols and examples that are being presented before us? Shall we pray? Loving Father in heaven, as we enter into a new example that is before us from your word, we ask for your guidance and for your direction. As we look at this example, we are to be presented with different items for our consideration. As we come before you, we ask for your wisdom, for your guidance. Help us to understand that which we are about to see. Direct us so that as we look to unpack these examples, we may properly apply them for what is occurring now and for what will occur in the future. Father, we have great need of you. As we assemble before you, we accept the promise that where two or more are gathered, you will be also. We need your spirit. We ask for your angels to attend us. We ask as well, Father, for your wisdom so that we may properly apply this and understand this for the time in which we currently live. Help us so that it is your character that others may see as we come to understand what is about to be presented to us. For this, we thank you. For this, we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay. As we open Judges 9, we have been applying a premise to different portions throughout this in the book of Judges. And the overriding premise has been that rather than attempting to identify a person based upon the examples that are before us, we are looking to apply this as a message. Now, as we enter into the study of Abimelech, I'm going to present before you a, a thought, either to be taken up or laid aside. So my question, my premise in this is, does Abimelech represent the presentation of the third angel's message of Revelation 14 in a false manner. Okay, so one of the things dealing with that question. So we know we're, I mean, this whole series is on understanding the lines. And when we look at the lines, we can see that we have all these way marks on a line and that we, we can zoom into a way mark and we have a line again. So in order to understand it as being the third angel's message, we'd have to know where it lies in the lines themselves. Um, we also see that the way marks, when they repeat, like you have these way marks on this line, that each, each way mark, in a sense, is a repeat and enlarge of the previous way mark. Or, in a sense, they're all the same message. So, since it's their line upon line, within a line, it's, it's going to be telling you the same story, but with different information and different details. Now, um, so with Judges 9, it's, we, we've had this story of Gideon, which we understood to be uh, the message of July 18th. 
And then when we look at Judges 9, uh, and, and we've also seen that each of these um, uh, enemies, these are, are enemies that have been left from the outside, right, that we have to fight against. They're there to test us. Now, Abimelech, he ends up being not an enemy that's left over, correct? Correct. Right. So, so this might be something different. And it would be an enemy within the movement if we're going to follow logically from what we've done before. Um, now, that would fit in with the idea that it's a false third angel's message. Part of the, the premise, as I'm coming to consider this, I agree that what we've been studying on this with Gideon is that this is related and is an example regarding the message of July 18th. The situation with Future for America was that its complete message was to be the restoration of the first and second angel's message of Revelation 14. And that we should be able to apply that within the time frame of the Millerites up until about April of 1844. The thought process that I've had about this with Judges 9 is that if this is indeed the third angel's message, we are aware that the third angel's message began to be recognized by October of 1844, but it was not until the Minneapolis meeting in 1888 that it was rejected. Mm -hmm. Since that point in time, the third angel's message has not been properly presented. It has not been presented within its native purity and truth. In fact, has been accepted as being correct with many shavings, much dirt, and trash thrown upon it mm -hmm. using some examples from Father Miller's dream. Mm -hmm. So applying the person of Abimelech to a message, the premise I ask, can we apply this to the false third angel's message that has existed and been being presented since 1888. Well, but we're also applying it to this movement. So the question is, does it apply to what is a false third angel's message in this movement? Well, we have yet to really give the third angel's message. Well, yes, I, I would agree there. But there is a profession of the third angel's message in this movement, which I know to be false. Right. So, again, if, if the premise that I'm presenting right now is incorrect, then I will most happily lay it aside. Well, if, well I think it would be correct, though. It's just that we would have to apply it to this movement, is all I'm saying. Okay. So, as we go into this with Abimelech, let's look at what Abimelech is in this, in this story, and let's consider the import of what Abimelech as a message has had upon the movement so that we may then go forward. So as we look at this, 
Abimelech conspireth with the Shechemites, murdereth his brethren, and is made king. Jotham's parable of the trees, whereby he reproacheth the men of Shechem with ingratitude, and foretelleth their ruin. The Shechemites conspire with Gaal against Abimelech. Zebul sendeth Abimelech notice thereof, who overcometh them, and soweth their city with salt. The Shechemites retire to an hold of the god Bareth, and are burned therein. Abimelech is slain at Thebes by a woman with a piece of a millstone. Finally, Jotham's curse is fulfilled. So Judges 9.1. And Abimelech, the son of Jerubal, went to Shechem unto his mother's brethren and communed with them and all the family of the house of his mother's father, saying, Note, please, that it does not say that Abimelech was the son of Gideon, as it is said that Gideon had 70 sons, six score and 10. But this is the son of Jerubal. Let Baal contend. Let the Lord contend. At this point in the scripture, they're not recognizing Abimelech as a legitimate heir. They're putting him in the name of as being the, the son of the false name that was being applied with Gideon. Mm -hmm. Now Abimelech went unto Shechem, unto his mother's brethren. Why is that important for us to understand? What is important of him going to his mother's brethren rather than to that of his father's brethren why is it important that he goes unto his mother's brethren and to his mother's father is he not turning away from that which Gideon had presented before his brethren. Right. So he's not accepting the 70 sons of Gideon. And even though they've gone off, um, he is, yeah, he, he's rejected the message of July 18. Right. That means in rejecting the message of July 18th, he's placed himself in a position of rejecting the first and the second angel's messages. And therefore he cannot be benefited by the true third angel's message. Mm -hmm. Now, this is still people within the movement as we are applying it. Because okay. then his mother, his mother's brethren, and the family of the house of his mother's father are those that are yet within Israel. We are not talking about Midianites. We are not talking about Amalekites. We are not talking about the children of the East. Mm -hmm. Speak, I pray you, in the ears of all the men of Shechem, whether it is better for you, either that all the sons of Jerubal which are three score and ten persons, reign over you, or that one reign over you. Remember also that I am your bone and your flesh. Uh, 
Why should you accept the message of July 18th? Why should you accept the first and the second angel's message as they understand it? Accept what I am saying to you. Because it's something that you've grown up with. Accept this because the message that I'm giving you is one of comfort, not one that is making you stretch your understanding. Speak, I pray you, in the ears of all the men of Shechem, what is good, whether that all the sons of Jerubal, which are three score and ten persons, reign over you, or that one reign over you. Why should you accept 70? Why should you accept the seven times when my message is simpler? Remember, I'm one with you. We are family. We are members. Membership has its advantages. You must be a member in order to be saved. How often are we seeing this played out before us currently? Now, we are reminded directly that in Judges 8.30, that Gideon had three scar and ten sons of his body, begotten for he had many wives. His sons are recognized, but his progeny of the concubine is set aside. Gideon had 70 sons. Jerubal had one with his concubine. And then we are to recognize as well that at a point within the, in Bible, Bible history, that Laban said unto him, Surely thou art bone of my thou art my bone and my flesh. And he abode with him the space of a month. Recognizing that Jacob was his family. So the recognition that's being given here is not to the 70 sons. It's to those that are still part of Israel, but are separate. How else should we apply this? How else can we look at this within the movement? I don't know. This seems. You dropped out there. I'm sorry. Yeah, it, it, it seems logical. Okay. And his mother's brethren spake of him in the ears of all the men of Shechem. All these words and their hearts inclined to follow Abimelech. For they, had, for they said, he is our brother. <clears throat> so the message of Abimelech is being accepted. How many were there at the general conference in 1888 that accepted the true message of righteousness by faith? Definitely not many. Mrs. White is very clear. Of all of the attendees in Minneapolis, there were only three that had an understanding of 
the message being presented. Herself, Jones, and Wagner. She could not include even her son at that time. And they gave him three score and 10 pieces of silver out of the house of Baal Bereth, wherewith Abimelech hired vain and light persons which followed him. Again, the symbol of 70 is being presented. What should we make of that symbol? I hate to interrupt the study, but I have I have to be excused for just a moment. I'll be right back. Okay, no problem. Okay, so um, what we see here with uh, the question that that Dwight is asking about the seventy pieces of silver. So we have why why would there be seventy pieces of silver? Why would they hire him? Why would they use this? So he's going to have, he's going to hire vain and light persons. It's like one piece of silver for each of the sons of um, Gideon. Okay. So that's the way that I would look at it, that it's not an arbitrary number. Um. But why, why would he have to do one piece of silver for each of the, the sons of Gideon? Is there a reason he'd have to do that? When the uh, children of Israel, they were to have half a shekel of the sign of the shekel of the sanctuary they were to contribute mm -hmm. so that was maybe like an offering okay. so I don't know if... yeah um well iran suggests maybe it was a bounty for each son so maybe that uh um, that would be the idea now um this hired light and vain persons. Um, or vain and light persons. Um, As we would say today, airheads, I guess, people that don't know the Lord, don't know his word, are yeah. just like cheap mercenaries. Yeah, because it's interesting, the words vain, of course, means empty. And light means like to bubble off, bubble up or froth. So they're kind of like bubble heads, I guess, sponge heads or something. Um, so they're unimportant, empty and unimportant. So what does this mean that he's going to hire empty and 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 frothy persons. What what would that mean? Other than, you know, the obvious meaning, their direct meaning, what would it mean symbolically? Because this is, we're going to look at this as a message. So there is a the message of July 18th, and now we're going to have um, something that's going to try to counter it. So, Dwight, we were talking about how vain means empty and light means like bubbly or frothy. Okay. So these persons that are hired, they would represent a message, a type of message. Exactly. Yeah, and so this message would be what kind of message? 
if it's empty and frothy? Well, if, if we consider this as an empty and frothy message, this is a message that does not satisfy. Mm -hmm. This is a message that does not spiritually nourish. Mm -hmm. It's a message that looks good, but does not last. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Well, if I give my two cents a little bit on some of this, because this is, I mean, it's it's rather involved. When I look at um, what has been brought against the message of July 18th, I mean, one is we see they've never really addressed it. Um, you know, no one has ever done some sort of um, analysis of the message and showed why it's wrong or where we've gone. They're, they're just more sort of these vague accusations that have been made uh, over the last few years, uh, you know, going back to uh, Bronwyn and then, you know, Larry Lesher and et cetera. So people who were attacking the message never really attacked the message at all. Mostly they try to attack the messengers of the message. Now, right. um, but there is also a message that, is put in place which is supposed to be the true message and and i and i don't put the message of colin or odilio in that in that place i don't think that their message is a counterfeit third angel's message i think that their message has a lot of light and has some misapplications but i wouldn't place it there at least what they are saying about um um, the chronology, I would think, is still based upon uh, the foundation that was laid. The problem is the interpretation of what it means. And I don't think that they're, they're presenting some grievous error that is misleading God's people. But attached to uh, this message, or attached to uh, what's being given, is are other ideas that would fit this class. And the one that particularly that, um, that we've discussed a little bit has to do with the medical missionary work. And if people know Jeff's history and his relationship to the medical missionary work, he definitely believed in the medical missionary work. But he did not endorse the medical missionary work that we see often in conservative circles. And does anybody know why? Why Jeff never endorsed all of these types of uh, uh, supposed medical missionaries, all these different sort of independent ministries that were doing medical missionary work? Why did he never endorse them? Okay. I who said that? I, I heard. William, William said it, but I could barely hear him. Yeah, I just heard. Uh, okay. And remember when we went back and we uh, examined the foundation? And right. in, in the first issue in January of, of 1996, in Our Firm Foundation, uh, the main article, the main uh, issues uh, that were, the articles that were in that issue, had to do with New Age medicine. Uh, Ellen White has a very clear health message and a very clear counsel on what medical missionary work is supposed to do, what it's supposed to be, how we are to conduct it. Uh, that it's something that we conduct with our neighbors, we learn simple remedies, we direct people to obedience to God's word. Um, we don't present miraculous cures for people who are disregarding God's commandments and laws of health, correct? Right. 
So we're not going to heal people who are not being obedient to God. Uh, would people agree with me on that one? Yes. Yeah. We are to be directing them to God, and we're not presenting miraculous cures that uh, will allow people to continue to transgress God's laws. But much of what we see in the medical missionary work is of that nature. They may be presenting some kind of, of uh, living, you know, that we have to, you know, be vegetarians and so forth. But mostly what they are presenting is what I would call miraculous cures. And I've been in the health work, I mean, for a lot of years. Um, and I've seen the different types of health work. I'm very familiar with uh, Uchi Pines and also Silver Hills. Um, and some other places as well that were connected with it. Um, and what I see and what Jeff saw was this sort of mixture of New Age and the councils in the spirit of prophecy. Uh, and we saw this particularly with the Dublins when they were in this message. I don't know if, how many people would know of them, um, but they had some very extreme views on treatments and upon uh, the use of drugs of any kind um, and extreme views on what uh, sanctification, how sanctification was connected with the health message. So their view was that we could become sanctified through the health message so that we had to have this uh, pure body then and if we were sick it was because we were not uh, following the health message and of course we know that sickness can come uh, for lots of other reasons but anyway uh, they were they were really teaching a lot of new age ideas but they're often quite uh, craftily hidden because the enemy is crafty so so Jeff never really did endorse these things. And I remember um, when we were at, um, in 2000, and let me see, it must have been, trying to think if it was in 2018. No, it couldn't have been. It had to have been 2016. Stephen, do you remember when uh, Tanya Beeman <coughs> went to some health, health, retreat were you there at the time yes okay and she was given to give her testimony at lambert church and jeff rebuked her yes Remember? i think that was uh was it did she mention lorraine day yeah i think so yes i remember okay. that yeah now these are again, you know, conservative Adventists, um, uh, supposedly doing medical missionary work, but it's of a nature that is contrary to the spirit of prophecy. And and so Jeff rebuked Tanya Beeman uh, for her testimony. He didn't accept her testimony. But we are seeing the same type of thing in this movement presently uh, with Mammon Wilson. You know, somebody who's not really a part of this message, um, and people are looking to that for light. And so I'm just using this as an example, because um, there's more to it than just uh, the medical missionary work. Because we need to be medical missionaries, but we need to follow the counsel and the spirit of prophecy and not the world, and especially not those who don't obey the truth. So no, it's a little bit of a rant, but I, I just want to make that really clear what I'm referring to. Okay. So as we as we entered into this in Judges mm -hmm. 9, verse 4, mm -hmm. they, his mother's brethren, 
gave him, gave Abimelech, my father is king, three score and 10 pieces of silver. We have three score and 10 sons of Gideon. We have three score and 10 pieces of silver out of the house of Baal Berith, the Lord of the Covenant. The 70 is an example for us. And it's one that we're going to have to very carefully consider since Gideon had 70 sons, 70 plus one, 70 sons of his accepted wives and one son from his concubine. That his mother's brethren gave unto Abimelech 70 pieces of silver from the house of the Lord of the Covenant. And of these 70 pieces of silver, Abimelech then hired frothy, bubbly, insubstantial messages that came and followed him. Mm -hmm. New Age medicine would be part of that. Right. And also a, a false representation of righteousness by faith. Exactly. Yeah. And the same one that Jeff constantly kept fighting against, it keeps showing up in this message and, and keeps professing to be true righteousness by faith. Agreed. And, and I saw that in 2010, actually, when I, uh, when I first came into the message at uh, Oklahoma. So we see the same message that was being presented at Oklahoma that Jeff opposed um, also being presented uh, in this movement, again, on righteousness by faith. Now, in verse 9 5, <clears throat> is there something that we have addressed in the past about the ninth day of the fifth month? Well, the tenth day of the fifth month is the day the temple was destroyed. The ninth day of the fifth month is the day that the Jews observe to commemorate the destruction of the temple. Okay. And he went in unto his father's house at Ophrah and slew his brethren, the sons of Jerubal, being threescore and ten persons, upon one stone. Notwithstanding yet, Jotham, the youngest son of Jerubal, was left, for he hid himself. How many sons of Gideon were destroyed? 69. So you're left with two sons, one of his wives and one of his concubines. Does that then mean that Jotham, being the remnant of the 70, is representing the true third angel's message? Well, it also could be representing the 70th week and the message of the 70th week. Agreed. Because one of the interesting things about this 70th week is that this has come up again. So in 2018, that's when we first looked at the literal week. And we're now looking at that again. 
in connection with the, the symbolic date of 2030. Because um, that was the date, you know, the first day of the first month in 2030 that the, the week of Christ pointed to. So, to me, this would fit perfectly with what's happening now and what Jotham represents. He represents a message that is a prophecy about the end of uh, Abimelech, as we'll see. We also have the, the midnight cry being 69 days to October 22nd, 1844. Okay. Well, prophet prophetically, it's also 70 days. Yeah. So we have additional witnesses that we can apply within this. Mm -hmm. One of the comments in the chat is 69 also refers to the sixth and the ninth hours of the crucifixion. Along with Mark 1533 being a symbol of the 1335. And, and Stephen, just explain the sixth and the ninth hour again and how those fit into the lines. You can give kind of a, a brief account of that. Uh, yeah, we had even connected it to Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Mm -hmm. The 6th and 9th of August. Yes. And um, yeah, so on the cross, it's from the 6th hour to the 9th hour where you have darkness. Yeah. And, um, but we also we can line it up with midnight in the midnight cry as well, can't we? Uh, in what way? Um, if we take the whole line, the whole day, and line it up, because the sixth hour is midnight, right? It's noon. Yes. Yes. Okay. So it's also midnight. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if we take that that day, we can line it up with with eighteen forty four with the message of the parable of the ten virgins. That that was my understanding of it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so there, there's a lot to it there as well, 69. But I would think the primary way we would look at it is this 70th son representing the 70th week, because we'll see that he gives a message, a prophecy. So we're tying this back with Daniel 9 with the 70 weeks that are accounted unto Daniel's people. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it would be interesting then to line taking all of the way marks that we already understand about Daniel 9 and placing Judges 9 in a line with, as far as its events, on a line corresponding to Daniel 9. Well, that's kind of interesting. Uh, I mean, one of the things we see in Daniel chapter 9 is he's addressing the 70 years initially, right? right? Um, but then he's going to be directed to uh, the prophecy of Leviticus 26. Right. And, and then he, for those 70 years, now he's going to have 70 weeks because... Uh, the 70 years were based on 490 years. And so now he's going to be given another prophecy of 490 years. But the primary uh, focal point is going to be the 70th week and Christ being crucified in the midst of the week. Now, isn't it interesting that there are many outside of the movement 
primarily within the Protestant churches that wish to place the 70th week somewhere far down the road. They don't yeah. place it as we would. Yeah, so in uh, dispensationalist uh, uh, understanding of prophecy, which is you know, primary evangelical, um, they're going to take the 70th week and remove it from the 69 weeks. Actually, they're going to have the seven weeks as one period of time, the 62 weeks as another, and the 70 and the 70th week as another period of time, not uh, connected together. Right. Yeah. But here he has gone unto his father's house in Ophrah. He recognizes that he must leave Shechem. He must go to Ophrah because the messages that are in Ophrah are disturbing to him. Now, he slays 69 sons, 69 of his brothers on one stone. Why is the one stone necessary for us to consider? Yeah, I've been thinking about that here. Um, now, there's two different Hebrew words commonly translated as one. There's ikad and yochid. Okay. This is ikad, which actually is a unity, which which I think is interesting. Um because that's the same when the Lord our God is one Lord, right? It's Yichad, not Yochid. But anyway, um, and then stone, of course, is Eben. Okay, now Eben, in this situation, he is attempting, or he, ha he succeeds in destroying 69 brothers on one foundation. Mm -hmm. For are we not told we are to build our house to have our faith upon the rock? Mm -hmm. Therefore, where is the message of Abimelech being constructed if it is not upon the rock? Well, it's being constructed upon a rock, but it's with the death of the 69 brothers. Well, I would say that, that his message, this Abimelech message, is being constructed upon less than the rock, less than Christ, and that, that Abimelech, this message, is looking to destroy those that would present a clear and correct message. So he is using a rock to shed their blood. Mm-hmm. In a manner of example, he is acting as a second Cain. Mm -hmm. So notwithstanding, yet Jotham, the youngest son, was left, for he hid himself. Jotham. <clears throat> Jehovah, Jehovah is perfect. Mm -hmm. So the third angel's message in its native clarity, in its native purity, comes directly from God and is perfect. Mm-hmm. 
Now, so, what, about, what about him hiding himself? Or am I jumping ahead? No, go ahead. Okay. Um, so, um, I mean, he's left, so he's a remnant, but he's also hidden. What are we told about the remnant that give this message at the end of Earth's history? Does Mrs. White not say that this remnant is largely unknown to the world and to the Catholics, but is may is well known to those that have chosen to join with the apostates. I look at this situation with Jotham. <clears throat> as being a message that God has hidden, that God has protected in order that the message may be given clearly and directly without any opposition. Now here again, if, if my premise is incorrect, I stand ready to set it aside. I don't fully understand why Jotham hid himself, but I think it's an interesting example for us to consider. Well, well, it would be that it's a hidden message. Where else have we seen that Mrs. White has considered something hidden? Well, the Apocrypha. It's interesting to me that I've had several within the movement that have opposed anything that I have presented from the Apocrypha. And they do not wish to consider that Mrs. White has noted the Apocrypha as the hidden book. Uh, return to 2 Corinthians 4, 3, it says, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. And verse 4 says, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Okay, then in your own words, how, how would you approach this? with Jotham. I really don't think that the gospel is hid except that people refuse to receive it. It's hid to those who don't discern it and don't accept it. Uh, Jotham okay. hid himself. I mean, if you want to take the story as is, he hid himself to save his life. Symbolic just as is hid, right? Okay, so symbolically, I how do you apply this? Um, I didn't catch that, sorry. Symbolically, how could we apply this? Well, we're going through these, these verses little by little, like very, very gradually and hopefully thoroughly. We're uncovering that which was hidden from us before, in a sense, because God wants to reveal more and more to us. But those who are not following this, this is all obscure. And to some of them, they can't comprehend it because they don't apply themselves to comprehend it. Part of our issue 
has been <clears throat> that there are those within the movement right now that wish not to have anything to do with specific persons. They're not willing to take the time as Father Miller would have done to compare these things line upon line, to look at these in both literal and symbolic methods. Now we're looking at this that the people that are being presented in these chapters, that we're not going to apply them as people today, but we're going to apply these as messages. Now we have, we have the message of Jotham against the message of Abimelech. We have the actions of Jotham, which we are soon to get into, contrasted with the actions of Abimelech. So we have the message that Jotham presents against the representations of Abimelech and the actions that are forthcoming of that message. The false third angel's message also presents a false right arm of that message. So it presents a false health message, which goes right in line with what was being addressed just a few moments ago. Does the true precede the false or does the false precede the true? Well, the false precedes the true. So are we not seeing this played out right now? Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> when we look at this, We know that Gideon built an altar at Ophrah, which he called it Jehovah Shalom. We also see from scripture that when Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, she arose and destroyed all of the seed royal. She wanted to consider, consolidate the power that she represented by getting rid of any of the other progeny of the king. Yet later in Judges, or excuse me, 2 Kings 11, that Jehoshiba the daughter of King Joram, sister of Ahaziah. Took Joash, the son of Ahaziah, and stole him from among the king's sons, which were slain, and they hid him, even him and his nurse, in the bedchamber from Athaliah, so that he was not slain. Here again, we have another one being hidden. So the question then is, is presented within the chat, contrasting or, or comparing the seed royal with chronology, the message of Palmoni. So do we make that application? Is this hidden? the portion of chronology that so many are currently rejecting. Well, I would think you'd have to do it that way. 
Okay. And all the men of Shechem gathered together and all the house of Mount Milo and went and made Abimelech king by the plain of the pillar that was in Shechem in the Hebrew or by the oak of the pillar that was in Shechem. After his victory over the Midianites, Israel sought to make Gideon their king, and he directly and correctly rejected their offer and said, you have not but God for your king. Abimelech is made king by the men of Shechem. He is not made king by the men of Israel, but by the men of Shechem. What do we see from this? And why is it important for us to note that this occurred by the oak of the pillar that was in Shechem. Um, the oak reminds me of 1 Kings 13 again, the true prof prophet and the errant prophet in Jeroboam's time. Okay. Well, this would also connect us with Genesis 35, 4. So we know that this is Jacob, where he's going to bury these uh, strange gods and hide them under the oak, which was the household idols. Yep. Yeah. So, so, I mean, it'd be quite significant that this is now in this sort of renewal, renewal of a covenant. Uh, of getting away of the idols, um, that this is going to be um, by the plane of the pillar that was in Shechem, or the oak that was in Shechem, the oak of the pillar. Jacob was making, <clears throat> was confirming a covenant that was made with God, correct? Yeah. So this is a a a false covenant. The way I would take it. This is the undoing of of what was done with Jacob. Would that be the way we'd look at it? I wouldn't say the undoing. I would say the rejection. Okay, the rejection then. Yeah, of a covenant. Okay. I mean, if if you're going to make a covenant with God, you're making a covenant with the Creator of the universe. Mm -hmm. If you're making a covenant with the adversary, are you not making a covenant with death? Yeah. So here is the men of Shechem. They have gathered together with this, the, the ruling house of Shechem, the house of Milo, and made Abimelech king by the plain of the pillar that was in Shechem, or by the oak of the pillar. We are recognizing that Jacob entered into covenant here by rejecting the household gods of Babylon. Now we are seeking to reject what Gideon stood for, but we are seeking to accept the word of the God of the covenant, the false God. And we're doing it at the same place that Jacob entered into his covenant. Now, it's interesting, as, as the translators had looked at this, their reference was Joshua 24. 
So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day, and he set them a statute and an ordinance in Shechem. And Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God, and took a great stone and set it up there under an oak that was by the sanctuary of the Lord. And Joshua said unto all the people, Behold, this stone shall be a witness unto us, for it hath heard all the words of the Lord, <clears throat> which he spake unto us. It shall be therefore a witness unto you, lest ye deny your God. Abimelech, <clears throat> excuse me. Abimelech is coming before the same oak, same pillar that Joshua set up, the same oak that Jacob had used to rid his family of idolatry. But Abimelech is approaching this not in reverence to God, but in a manner to grasp the hearts and the minds of his relatives and the men of Shechem. He was not giving glory unto God. He was not fearing God. Therefore, he could not see that the hour of his judgment had come. Now, and when they told it to Jotham, he went and stood in the top of the Mount Gerizim. And lifted up his voice and cried and said unto them, Hearken unto me, ye men of Shechem, that God may hearken unto you. <clears throat> He's on the top of Mount Gerizim. Was this the Mount of the Blessings or the Curses? Deuteronomy 11.29. And it shall come to pass when the Lord thy God hath brought thee in unto the land, whether thou goest to possess it, that thou shalt put the blessing upon Mount Gerizim and the curse upon Mount Ebal. These shall stand upon Mount Gerizim, as it shows in Deuteronomy 27.12 to bless the people when you are come over Jordan, Simeon and Levi and Judah and Issachar and Joseph and Benjamin. Of what tribe was Gideon? Well, because Joseph is there um, representing Manasseh and Ephraim. Right. He's standing, Jotham is standing on the Mount of Blessing. Mm -hmm. So when you're standing on the Mount of Blessing, what are you speaking to? Are not your words directed to the Mount of the Curses? Oh, so you're saying that he's on the Mount of Blessing, that he's addressing Ebal? Right. Is he not trying to help his brethren recall that there are blessings for following God and there are curses of not following God? Is he not 
directly addressing them in the light of Leviticus 25 and 26. Well, yes, because it's connected to that. So is part of the work of the third angel to reveal clearly the blessings and the cursings for the true and the false worship? Well, we know that the, the everlasting gospel is a prophetic uh, three-step testing message that develops and demonstrates two classes of worshipers. Right. So those that receive the blessing and those that receive the curse. So that is the work of the third angel. All three messages, but completed with the work of the third angel. Right. But if you reject the first two messages, are you going to be benefited by the third? No. So he stands on Mount Gerizim. He lifts up his voice. Is he not, in lifting up his voice, is he not acting as a trumpet, calling to the people to remind them of their need to worship God in spirit and in truth? And he's also giving the midnight cry. Exactly. And he said unto them, hearken unto me, ye men of Shechem that God may hearken unto you. Listen to me, ye men of Shechem, that God will hear and listen to you. The trees went forth on a time to anoint a king over them. And they said unto the olive tree, reign thou over us. The trees. We are told to see 1 Kings 14.9. And Jehoash, the king of Israel, sent unto Amaziah, the king of Judah, saying, the thistle that was in Lebanon sent to the cedar that was in Lebanon, saying, Give thy daughter to thy son to wife. And there passed by a wild beast that was in Lebanon and trode down the thistle. What is being represented by the trees? Well, they're, they're, they're people, Re rejectors, rebels in this case. So the tree went forth to anoint a king over them. And they said unto the olive tree, reign thou over us. But the olive tree said unto them, should I leave my fatness? wherewith by me they honor God and man and go up and down for other trees or to go to be promoted over the trees. So the olive in this that provides its fruit, that provides its oil, says to the other trees, I'm not interested. I know my place. What else can we determine here?
Was not olive oil important for the people and in the sanctuary? What oil was used in the lamp that was in the holy place? Olive oil. What olive oil was poured upon the what oil was poured upon the heads of those that would become king? Yeah, they were anointed with olive oil. So olive oil provoked was was a symbol to provide light in the holy place to anoint and to also nourish there are three things three steps that are then taken with the olive tree that are important for us to note, especially as the sanctuary is considered. But is that making the olive and the fruit of the olive to be king over others? In my mind, I would have to look at this that the olive being more connected with the sanctuary was a better representation of a priest than a king. And the trees said to the fig tree, come thou and reign over us. And the fig tree said unto them, should I forsake my sweetness and my good fruit and go to be promoted over the trees? Then said the trees unto the vine, come thou and reign over us. And the vine said unto them, should I leave my wine, which cheereth God and man, and go to be promoted over the trees? Then said the trees unto the bramble, or the thistle, come thou and reign over us. Do you see a progression in the different portions of this prophecy? A step-by-step -step direction First, they turn to the olive that is representational of that which can be applied to the priests. Then they turn to the fig. Then they turn to the vine. But finally, they turn to the bramble. Does the bramble provide anything useful? Does the bramble nourish? Does the bramble provide something to drink? Does it provide light? All of these things it does not do. What good is the bramble? What is the purpose of the bramble? It illustrates the curse. Exactly. And it illustrates the curse because the bramble 
is very painful. If you get a thistle that punctures your skin, you want to get rid of it as quickly as you can, don't you? Gideon made use of the bramble, the thistles, to teach the men of Shechem their folly in not providing nourishment to his army. And the bramble said unto the trees, if in truth ye anoint me king over you, then come and put your trust in my shadow. And if not, let fire come out of the bramble and devour the cedars of Lebanon. How much of a shadow is a thistle going to provide? This thistle is saying, trust me. I'm going to provide a shadow for you to rest in. What kind of a shadow is there? I mean, when I think of all the thistles and the brambles that I've seen in my life, its shadow is insubstantial. Yep. Yeah. The people are offering a message that really is in, insubstantial. It flatters human nature, but right. it is no substance. And it doesn't bring a conviction. It doesn't show that you're a sinner. It actually makes you feel that you're righteous, that you're better than other people. Are we, how can we come to the foot of the cross with an attitude that we're better than other people? Well, you can't. Many times I have been confronted with people that when they are given a message, a true message of the gospel, they have looked at me and said, I'm a good person. And if there is a God, he knows that. I have no need to act as you are suggesting. I have no need to come to the foot of the cross to confess my sins. I have no need to admit that I've hurt other people because I am a good person. How many of us are good? For there is not one that is good, save God. Are any of us good? Can any of us be accepted, be justified, sanctified and come to judgment in and of our own merits. Mm -hmm. Many times we're going to be facing this. We have to decide, are we going to trust in a bramble for its shade? Or are we going to trust in Christ? Because the bramble does not represent Christ. Now, therefore, if you have done truly and sincerely, and that ye have made Abimelech king, 
And if ye have dwelt well with Jerubal and his house, and have done unto him according to the deserving of his hands, for my father fought for you, and cast his life far, and delivered you out of the hand of Midian. My father, Gideon, has done battle on your behalf. And if ye are risen up against my father's house this day, and have slain his sons, three score and ten persons, upon one stone, and have made Abimelech, the son of his maidservant, king over the men of Shechem, because he is your brother. If ye have dwelt truly and sincerely with Jerubal and his house this day, then rejoice ye in Abimelech, and let him also rejoice in you. But if not, let fire come out of Abimelech and devour the men of Shechem and the house of Milo, and let fire come out from the men of Shechem and from the house of Milo and devour Abimelech. And Jotham ran away and fled and went to Beer and dwelt there for fear of Abimelech, his brother. <clears throat> this is the prophecy of Jotham. So, what symbols do we see within this prophecy? How can we apply this within the movement? Now, we are coming close to the end of our time together today. I think it would be best for us to take this up first thing in tomorrow's meeting mm -hmm. and to cover this and delve into it much more deeply. So your assignment today, as we are looking at this, is to go back over from Judges 9, 7 to verse 9, 21, 14 verses. Let's consider this carefully and see what symbols we can come to out of this prophecy as to how it relates within the movement. Any other thoughts, comments, or questions? No. Nope. Um, yeah, we need to pick this up again. It's There's some interesting things here. There's a lot more depth that many people would, would have considered. Hmm. All right. Shall we then close with prayer? Gracious Father in heaven. There is no shadow of turning with you. We need you. We need your direction. We need your guidance. Most of all, we need your wisdom. Help us now to consider this which we are reading. Direct us so that we may more clearly understand the symbols that are being presented. Help us today that all those with whom we come in contact may see you, may see your character and not ours. I thank you for all that have participated in today's meeting. I thank you for those that will listen to this later. Be with us now. Direct us as we prepare to go through our day. And for those that are now at the close of their day. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer.
for guiding us and for being with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.